Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Young JW3's My Big Fat Jewish Body with Moisha House and Fat Torah. We're so excited to have you here this evening. Let us know where you're calling in from. We're really looking forward to seeing who's here and where they're coming from. Keep your cameras on, make a community here. Um, this evening's event has been supported by Genesis Philanthropy Group, and we're really privileged to have their support for this evening. So I am Joe Hyman, Communities and Special Events Programmer here at JW3. And if you've not connected with us in before, we are the Jewish Community Centre in London that's open to all. Tonight's evening is the beginning of Young JW3's Season of Love, which will culminate with our Summer of Love Fest on the 25th of July at JW3. But tonight, we're turning the love inward and exploring fat phobia within our community and having a conversation about the importance of self-love and creating spaces where Jews of all body shapes and sizes feel liberated and celebrated. We've got Fat Torres, Rabbi Minna Bromberg, and body liberation activists, Chelsea Snyder and Lucy Cohen, who will discuss weight stigma, fat liberation, and examine how fat phobia impacts us as individuals and communities. You'll have a chance to ask questions later if you message them to me in the chat. Um, but for now, we're gonna hear from our partner, Moisha House, a little bit about what they do and who they are. And um, we'll bring Lily Naz um, from Moisha House Clapham on to the stage. Let's see if she is here with us. Here we go. Linaz, hello. Tell us a little bit about Moisha House. Hi. Hi. So my name's Lily Naz, and like Joe said, I'm a resident at Moisha House Clapham. And Moisha House is all about um, young people building inclusive grassroots communities for young people. Moisha House sets up. Um, homes all around the world um, for young Jewish people aged 22 to 32 to create their own communities that are welcoming and for people of all different kinds of backgrounds outside of like denominational space. Um, you don't need uh, you don't need any kind of special affiliation or membership to be part of Moisha House. It's all about um, reaching out and um getting all different kinds of people involved um and part of that is having partnered events like this with jbw3 so i see a lot of familiar faces here but i'm also seeing a lot of new faces um and we're really excited to start this super important conversation with you all thank you so much joe thanks so much Linaz. all right so let's let's kick off let's kick off this evening and bring our wonderful speakers onto the virtual stage. Hey Chelsea, um, let's bring up Lucy and we'll bring up Rabbi Minna. Um, and just so you know everyone, that wonderful song we listened to when we joined um, was actually Rabbi Minna singing. Um, she's an incredible musician and songwriter um, as well as lots of other things which we'll hear about this evening. But I wonder if we can just throw out to each of you to tell us a little bit about yourself um, about your work and and why you're on tonight's panel what brings you to this space um so let's so let's ask rabbi minna first i'm delighted to be here i am the president and founder of fat torah which started just about a year ago we're getting ready to start to celebrate our first anniversary as an effort to confront weight stigma in jewish communal life and deploy jewish tradition in ways that are liberatory for all bodies. Uh, I'm, uh, I live in Jerusalem with my husband and two children. I've been involved in fat activism for the last 30 years. And I have, was ordained at Hebrew College in Boston. Amazing, thank you, Rovmina. And let's hear from Lucy. Hi. Um, so I'm Lucy, I am the director of Noam Mazorsi Youth, uh, but in my spare time I'm also a belly dance teacher and a burlesque performer. Um, my burlesque name is Susan uh, and my bio is always and forever um, fat, fabulous and a little bit filthy. Um, and I love being a very present and proudly fat role model in all three of those spaces. 
Thanks so much, Lucy. We're really delighted to have you here this evening. And Chelsea. Hi, everyone. I'm Chelsea Snyder. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I work for the Jewish Federation of Los Angeles on the young adult team called New Roots, where I engage with young adults and building community and really getting into the depths of our why and why we're sitting here and coming together. Um, I've been on a self-love journey for 15 years and man, has it had its twists and turns, um, but community is so important to me. I come from an underserved Jewish community and um, to me, fat liberation is just goes hand in hand with what community is all about. Um, so my goal is I want people to feel like their most authentic selves, whether they're fat, whether they're thin, wherever you are, but really also being visible, being that person on the beach in the bikini, being the first one to take off their shawl, to give permission to others, to feel that they can take up as much space as they want to. Amazing. Thank you so much, Chelsea. What a panel we have here tonight from across the world, from LA, Israel, and London. Um, so before we get into the conversation, I want to just give a moment because I think we've mentioned a lot of jargon and we've mentioned a lot of kind of words that people may not know about. You may know feelings of, of, of what it means to feel fat phobia, but let's talk about that. So there's fat phobia, there's weight stigma, body liberation. What does that all mean? Um, so we're going to, I'm going to jump off this stage. I'm going to take Chelsea and Lucy with me for a little bit and give her by Minna the stage are going to talk a bit about what is this? How did it how how does it happen? How does it manifest? And what can we learn about it before we delve into the personal experiences of the people here? Um, so Rabbi Minna, over to you. Thanks so much. So I want to start with the word fat, which is a word that I and other body liberation activists uh, and other fat folks use as a morally neutral term to describe our bodies. And part of, I think it's important to start off by saying that because of course, so often fat is used as a slur um, and as a way to denigrate other people. And so we can hear just in the way that we often think of the word fat as being used uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a denigrating or dismissive way <clears throat> that, that fat phobia or weight stigma or anti-fatness is really a part of all of our everyday lives. And one thing that's particularly helpful for me in thinking about how to understand how fat phobia operates in our society is to be clear about the fact that fat phobia impacts people of different sizes differently. So one way of thinking about this is thinking about three different types of fat phobia, which I'm gonna very quickly give a little overview of. So we can think of fat phobia in, internally meaning the ways that people of any size could have dissatisfaction with their own bodies. We can think of fat phobia that's interpersonal, meaning the mean things that people might say to one another. Often this comes um, from family members or people who are close to us, um, criticizing our bodies and expressing their judgments of our bodies to us directly. Um, and that tends, to that tends to impact folks in larger bodies, but um, certainly there are many, many stories, and some of you may have stories like this, of being in a relatively small body, but having like that one relative who's quite critical and says that you're not thin enough. So just to acknowledge that that interpersonal fat phobia can actually impact um, people of different sizes, but tends to be more impactful on people in larger bodies. And then finally, we can think about systemic fat phobia. And just as with any other systemic form of oppression, it's important to think about the way that we measure this by looking not so much at intentions or at feelings or um, at the interpersonal interactions, but really at the impacts on larger people as a group and the impacts on our life chances. So, to, so systemic fat phobia, even for people who might feel horrible about their bodies or feel wonderful about their bodies, systemic fat phobia doesn't really care about that. Systemic fat phobia impacts people exclusively in larger bodies. 
and it impacts us in the form of discrimination in healthcare and in employment and in education. Um, there was a horrible recent case in the UK um, of two children who were removed from their otherwise perfectly loving parents because their parents failed to make them lose weight. Um, so they were actually removed and put um, removed from their home. Um, so, um, and we also have um, just one other example. There was a recent study that came out that looked at how uh, fat students versus thin students were judged on the same, um, on the same um, paper that they had written for school. Um, and on the same paper, if the teacher perceived that the student was fat, they got a lower mark than if the teacher perceived that the student was thin. So I could go on with examples, but I'm not going to. That's just to give you a sense of the, the breadth of what we mean when we say fat phobia or anti-fatness, that it includes both the negative feelings that any of us can have about ourselves in a fat phobic society, but it also includes these impacts that really don't don't matter whether you love yourself or not, right? I can love myself and thank God most days do love myself um, hugely um, and still be quite impacted by that more systemic form of fat phobia. So I'm glad to be with you and really looking forward to um, hearing what my other fellow panelists have to say about all of this. Thank you so much, Rabbi Mena. I really appreciate you taking us through that. And if that's you know, brought up any questions for our audience, then please message me in the chat or message in the chat asking the questions because we're going to have some time later on for questions about any of the, the terms used or the different kind of ways of fat phobia manifesting in our world. Um, but for now, we're going to have a conversation with our panelists. So fat phobia, you know, we, we don't hear the word fat phobia from the minute that we're born, but we experience it. Um, and I think what I want to start with is speaking about um, each of your experiences of fat phobia, specifically in the Jewish community. We're here tonight to talk about you know, how our experiences in the Jewish community have impacted us. Um, and I really want to hear about what that looks like. So let's start with Chelsea and kind of hear a little bit about what your experience look like. Thank you. Um, <laughs> have to take a breath because it's hard to pinpoint one moment. Um, I just want to name that I'm usually the largest person in the room and I love that. And that's great. And, um, I own that. And with that comes many different layers. So what I've been experiencing lately in the Jewish community, um, is really just taking a look at where am I sitting? <laughs> and I know that sounds silly. That sounds silly, but it's something that we think about. It's something that I'm like, okay, I'm going to be in this meeting for five hours or whatever it is. Um, am I going to be in pain the entire time? These chairs weren't built for my body. Um, so in a very kind of quick way, that's one of them. And then I also have this kind of memory that I wanted to share that ties into this idea of um, always feeling like I had to be a high performer so that I was taken seriously. So in Hebrew school, I remember being in a class and um, I was always bullied, like always bullied for being fat. And a kid in my Hebrew school literally called me a pig in front of the entire class. And um, I looked at my Hebrew school teacher. How is my teacher going to respond in this moment? Am I going to be taken care of? Am I going to be validated? What's going to happen? And it was very much a like, okay, let's move on. Um, and in that moment of um, not being seen or heard made me realize that um, a lot of the bullying that I experienced, I didn't have an advocate. I didn't have an advocate in school in my Jewish life. I was seen as a tattletale um, because <laughs> for whatever reason, um, and that kind of led me to silencing this, to silencing uh, the name calling, to silencing what all that looked like because my role model, my teacher didn't step in in that moment. Um, so those are some very kind of basic examples, but um, I think there's a conditioning of having to hyper perform to be taken seriously to be seeing as equal um, as your counterparts in whatever role that is if it was as a child or even now as you know a young adult um, going for that promotion whatever it is I feel 
um, I have to work twice as hard to be seen as equal as a, an attractive person, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And I want to note, um, you know, we went, we went straight from the theory of fat phobia into the experience without that breath that Chelsea mentioned. And I want to say that the experiences and what people will be sharing this evening and what I'm sure many of our audience are thinking about are deep personal feelings and lots of trauma around this, this, this topic. And I think I just want to name that, that we, when we have conversations about this, that we be sensitive and we listen with open ears and with kind ears about what people have been through when it comes to fat phobia. Um, thanks so much, Chelsea, for being so vulnerable. And Lucy, I want, let's hear about your experience. Um, so when we first got sent these questions, I read this and I was like, oh my God, like what? How do I start to condense down my experience of fat phobia at all? And then within the context of the Jewish community, um, feels like a really overwhelming question to me. Um, I wanna echo two things that Chelsea said in particular is like, um, being the largest person in the room is definitely a feeling I have often, um, although that is not exclusively in Jewish spaces, I would say, but that is the world in which I work. Um, and also that thing of like having to be a high performer um, definitely resonates with me. Um, not to be too on brand, but to talk about youth movements um, for a moment. I actually think the thing I've been reflecting on is how grateful I am for Jewish youth movements. Um, I think my experience of fat phobia in, in the Jewish world was less so because of the youth movement that I was in. And I hope it's the case for other youth movements also. And I definitely know it's the case for other peer led Jewish spaces I've been in. Because your leaders and the people around you as your role models are just people from the community. I had the opportunity to see leaders and people being there for me and showing up for me who look like me also, not everyone, but significantly more so than I think out, I've experienced outside of the Jewish community. And that's something I'm really, really grateful for. And I was actually reflecting a lot on the fact that some of the women that I look up to most as role models in my life, or I'm not sure they would use this word, but I would say fat women who are just excelling in their career and absolute role models and superstars and just like so respected for the work that they do that their size, at least in my mind, has never been part of the consideration of who they are. If anything, it's only ever been a positive for me when I've kind of stopped to think about it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really know how to answer what my experience is of fat phobia in the Jewish community. I think also my entire life is lived through the lens of being a fat person, which is something to like unpack more perhaps at another point. But actually I'm really grateful for the Jewish community. I think it does a lot to un like undo some of the fat phobia in the wide in wider society and provide role models that I didn't see in other places. Thanks so much, Lucy. A really interesting perspective about how kind of youth movements and peer-led spaces kind of provide those role models. I definitely see that in some way. Um, Minna. Yes, thank you, Lucy. I want to sort of take the, the opposite piece, which is what happens in spaces where there's actually a power dynamic between leaders and community members. Um, so I've been collecting a lot of stories about um, bad clergy behavior, um, which you know I haven't been privy to because I tend not to express fat phobic thoughts when I'm serving in a clergy role, but I've really been hearing a lot of um, very difficult stories about the ways that community members are impacted when rabbis and cantors and educators, um, you know, express their own um, anti-fat views publicly and communally. Um, and I'll share with you one personal experience of sort of the flip side of that, of being in a, um, in a rabbinic role where, you know, I was new to the community. I'm supposed to be, I was younger than and my congregants, right? On the one hand, there's sort of this sense that I'm meant to be in some kind of position of authority. And there's also always kind of this, you know, like, should we actually listen to her and to her or not? And I had um, a congregant come up to me at Kiddush um, and ask how far my walk had been to get to synagogue that Shabbat morning because she knew that it's my practice not to drive or ride on Shabbat. So she knew that I'd walked there. Um, and I told her that it was two miles. And she said, wow, that's gonna be so good for you. Right, so this was someone who knew nothing about whether two miles was 
a long walk for me or not, knew nothing about what my sort of movement goals were around how to move my body um, and was just uh, making this big assumption about what my own habits were and, um, and what they ought to be. Um, and so you can imagine, right, that if you're coming in to try to be a teacher to a community that to know that every single person there is having their own opinions about sort of how, um, how much they should listen to you, how much they should um, treat you with respect was quite, quite undermining. Um, so that's uh, just one little example. Thank you, Mina. I really appreciate that perspective as a clergy member and also you know, in that interaction with your with your community. Um, one piece that I want to explore um, before we talk about kind of how maybe Jewish tradition and culture impacts us kind of beyond the community experience um, is the kind of intersectional identities when it comes to um, experiencing life as a fat person. Um, I think that adds, sorry, one second. Um, I think that adds a lot and often people are coming to this with not just their identity as a fat person, they're coming with multiple identities and it can, can, can affect and can it conflate and become a, um, a bigger issue in different spaces. So I wonder if I could ask um, Lucy to talk about this one first um, and hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think something that I really hold on to a lot is um, I'm really grateful for my queer identity. And I think that intersects massively with like my fat identity. I really believe that um, once you go through the journey of accepting your queer self, it gives you permission to queer everything else in your life and to step outside of boxes and to queer other things that we're told are the way to do things. Um, and I'm really grateful because I think embracing a queer identity has allowed me to embrace and love my fat self even more. Um, it's allowed me to be in relationship with people in a different way, um, with different bodies from me. But particularly for, for myself and that self-love journey, I definitely think going on the journey of accepting like my queer identity, you know, once you can do that and love yourself through that, it just opens up so many more doors. And, and to say like, if I can accept myself in that space, if I can love myself through that journey, um, and also accept that like, okay, my life may not look how I once thought it would. Well, then why can't I do that the same for my body? And to be grateful that my body is the body taking me through that journey. Um, yeah, and I, I really hold on to like, being queer in one way opens up doors to being queer and queering life in so many other ways. And I think that interse intersection is absolutely fundamental. Thanks so much, Rosie, for that insight, you know, that, that opening up. Um, I want to speak to Chelsea kind of about about this as well. I think we discussed this when we, when we chatted earlier um, that fat phobia also has its roots in racism. Um, and that's a really important facet of this conversation. And I wonder if you could kind of speak to that um, somewhat, but also from your own personal kind of that as a kind of concept, but from your own personal experience as well of intersectionality. Absolutely. Um, so the roots of fat phobia in steered in racism steeped in there, it all comes back down to beauty standards and who created them. I think whenever we see an image, we have to be questioning, uh, what is the intention of this image? What is the intention of this product? Who's behind it? Coming back to the why. <laughs> and um, usually it's to monetize someone else's vision of beauty, usually somebody that's a white man. Um, we can dive deeper into that another time. But um, in terms of intersectionality, just bouncing back, I agree with, I love what Lucy said, queering life, um, totally just drink that up. Um, also the intersectionality of what it means to be a Jewish person in 2021 and the many, many <laughs> uh, layers of being Jewish and, and Jew-ish <laughs> and, and, and what is that, what it, the, what that means. I come from an underserved Jewish community. So my experience is always defending my Judaism, is always being the only Jewish person in the room, was having to explain and, and feeling this responsibility and burden on my shoulders of being the representation of Jewish life to my community. So with that intersectionality, what does that mean? Being fat, being queer, <laughs> coming from an underserved space, 
it's provided me an opportunity to always think about who has a seat at the table and who are we providing our community experiences for and are we perpetuating kind of programming and community for everyone that's already in on it or are we thinking about who is on the fringes and that to me is my why i'm in this work is for the outliers is for the people that didn't feel they had an invitation to the space yeah, that's really beautiful i think seeing how lucy speaks about kind of taking that as a an impulse to queer everything else about your life and, and opening up an opportunity and chelsea you're speaking about how you use that as a lens to support others i think those two elements which i'm sure both of you contain within yourselves um are really wonderful ways of how your intersecting identities kind of complement what's going on with this conversation um i'd love to just hear from minna about perhaps Jewish tradition um, and how Jewish tradition has impacted your relationship. You, you founded an organization called Fat Torah. Um, you know, I'd never heard of Fat Torah until I saw you on Instagram <laughs> and thought, wow, someone is talking about um, our teachings of, of, of Judaism and how that can impact how we feel about our body. So talk to me a little bit about, about that. How was that journey for you? How did you find texts that supported how you felt? So in terms of the beginning of my journey, I started dieting as a seven year old and was done with that by the age of 16. And it was at that point that I started connecting with the fat liberation movement in the US, which when I got involved in the 1990s had already been going since 1969. And it was pretty immediately clear to me that whenever I heard about Yitziat Mitzrayim, the, the exodus from Egypt, that I was forever from that point forward, from the moment I stopped dieting, going to hear it as being a freedom from narrowness, right? So there's this pretty popular translation of Mitzrayim, of, of Egypt, as the narrows, as the narrow places. Um, and um, it's one of those things that once you know once you hear it that way i personally sort of can't can't not hear it that way um that um that for me this idea that on on pesach on passover we're meant to relive and re-experience going out of the narrow places that for me that was absolutely about my decision as a as a teenager to stop dieting which um, i say because i think that like the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, you're, you're leaving a place that's untenable and a place of stuckness without knowing what comes next, right? There is no roadmap for how to be a 16 year old fat liberationist. That's like not a, certainly wasn't a thing when I was trying to do it. Um, and so I think that that sense of having um, a tradition that could support me in that was, was really important to me. In terms of how Fat Torah itself emerged, um, when I so I started writing about that that journey of my own um, about 15 years ago now um, in public in small um, public ways, and also taking the opportunity to see how I could interpret other um, Torah and other Hebrew Bible texts in ways that were supportive of body liberation. And I'll tell you one favorite example of how Jewish tradition um, comes up for me around this, which is um, very briefly, because um, it's a bit of a long story, but very briefly, I um, was at the Hanukkah party for my, uh, for my young daughter's um, gan, her kindergarten. And um, the children, these, you know, like 53 to five-year-olds, um, were dancing around and um, they were, then we took a break to eat sufganiyot, to eat fried um, jelly donuts. And um, the, the person who had been leading the music um, decided that, you know, it was time to come back to, to music. And so he said, well, you can all come back to dancing now unless you've gotten too fat from eating those sufganiyot. And um, it was a moment for me of really deeply feeling how painful it is when fat phobia interacts with Jewish tradition and um, when, um, when fat phobia sort of invades Jewish tradition. 
and really serves as a barrier to full participation and full enjoyment of the tradition. And in the same moment, this sense of, wait a second, doesn't this guy know, like, doesn't this guy understand that this is Hanukkah and that Hanukkah is actually a celebration of fat. Like that's what we're actually here to do is to celebrate the symbol of fat as a, to celebrate fat as a symbol of our endurance as a people. Um, and so that combination of seeing the ways that anti-fatness is particularly harmful in the context of communities where we want everyone to have a sense of belonging. And on the flip side of that, the ways that our tradition can be so powerfully deployed in liberatory ways was really, um, was really what is, is my why. That's what drives me in this way. I remember seeing the, the Hanukkah piece. I think that's what drew me into Fat Torah and that kind of celebration of fat and, and oil and it being integral to the festival um, really kind of, yeah, took me on my own journey with this. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that. I'm going to just switch the fan on because I don't know if you can see that I'm very warm. Um, one second. Um, excuse the sound if it's very loud, but um, this is self-care in itself. Um, Let's throw the question to Chelsea and then I'll mute myself so you don't hear my, my fan. But Chelsea, how, how has Jewish tradition or Jewish culture impacted your relationship, maybe positively or negatively? So the, the text and the history and anything like that that's been part of your life. Yeah, I'm gonna lean a little bit deeper into culture and as Jews, we eat a lot of food. <laughs> Food is the center of our gathering space, which is so beautiful and also so hard when you're witnessing or growing up with food being your enemy because you're being told it should be. Um, so very similar to what Mena said about <laughs> policing. So many moments in Jewish spaces, Jewish ritual, family gatherings of people policing my body, um, policing the incredible food that I wanted to partake in, um, feeling like I had to modify what I wanted to eat if I did eat at these gatherings at a certain point because I didn't want anyone to say anything or to think that I had too big of a portion. Um, but then I lean also towards the beauty of leaning into this delicious food, the, the ceremony of Passover and what that means to sit around the table to tell this story of freedom, of liberation, of I'd like to find the fat liberation in that story <laughs> as well, or in, in my mind it is. Um, and, and I also think about high holidays, this time that is supposed to be kind of um, a seasonal moment to root into our religion, you know, to Shuvah, to, to lean into that. And as a young, young person, really getting nervous over this obligation to fast and can I make it? Um, I fasted other days because I was terrible to my body, but now I'm being told I have to. So what happens if I can't do it? What happens if I have to break that and the pressure? So I think about ritual, I think about pressure, and I think also about um, another cultural piece is just how we measure success. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but um, for so long, for whatever reason in my family, success was tied to um, you were romantically involved with someone. And so all of my family would ask all the thin members of my family, who are you dating? Who are you this? And then I was kind of skipped over. Um, it was never really thought to ask me because um, the implication to me was she's not dating anyone in her fat body. And maybe that's a stretch, but that's part of the lived cultural piece. Um, this idea of what success looks like. And to me, in a lot of Jewish spaces, success equals thinness. Thank you for bringing that cultural piece into it. I think it's so vital talking about that and how and how the rituals and, and, and kind of fast impact that, but also that, that, that assumption that, oh, okay, there, there wouldn't be someone that, that would be dating. Um, that just, yeah, that, that, struck a chord with me. Um, I'm going to move the conversation forward. We've discussed 
our experiences of that phobia, how the Jewish community has impacted them, how Jewish tradition and culture has impacted it. And we can hear more about that a bit later um, in the questions. But what I want to ask you is kind of the, the next stage. You, three of you are here talking not just about fat phobia, but about liberation, body liberation from weight stigma. <laughs> and I'd love to hear a little bit about what that looks like for you, um, because I think people watching here tonight would want to emulate that in some way and find the ways that they can liberate themselves from ideals around their body. Um, so I'm going to throw it to Lucy first, um, and then Chelsea and then Minna. Um, Lucy, kind of what, what does it look like to liberate yourself from this feeling? A, a huge, huge question um, with many hours of work and lots of money in therapy um, to condense down. But I think a really big thing for me about um, fat liberation, body liberation, is just not letting my body be the reason that I don't do anything in life which is definitely a place that I have been in before. Um, no, I'm gonna look stupid doing that, or that's not what fat people do, or I can't do that because I'm fat. And it's not even always like a conscious, clear, linear thought. Um, but as soon as I realized ever that that was, working really hard to shut that down. My body, the way society views my body is not gonna be the reason that I don't do something. Um, because life is too short and I value it too much to do that. Um, I've been really, really lucky to be surrounded by incredibly loving, supportive people in my life and had the opportunity to travel and live in cultures and places where I could feel perhaps less viewed, less, I think that's part of the Jewish community piece also, is like when you're in a Jewish community, sometimes you feel so just like seen all the time and it's, it's very overwhelming. Um, and I think uh, to share maybe a bit of a personal story of kind of some of the liberation that and the journey I went on um, I used to joke at university that like yeah yeah in my final year I'll join like feminist society and belly dancing and like for some reason the two were at odds in my head and that's nonsense but also like the idea of me a fat woman joining belly dancing society was like the joke I made before anybody else could like make a joke about my body and then I was lucky enough to move to Mumbai and a friend invited me to a belly dancing class. And I was like, okay, like sure, hilarious, let's do this. Like it's finally happening. And it turns out I love it. Um, and it was incredible. And for the first month of classes, I would like cover up as much as possible and do whatever I could. And it turns out that like, and I, I don't wanna play into that thing of like, oh, you have to like hyper perform in order to be valid. But it definitely did turn into like, this is so not to do with what size my body is, it's to do with what I can do with it. And I really enjoy this and I'm good at it. And this brings me joy. And I'm not gonna let my size stop me from enjoying like two hours of belly dancing on a Saturday when I'm living in a country where I feel very isolated and life is not always so easy. And also there's free AC for two hours. And that was a bit of a luxury at one point in my life. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that journey for me started with belly dancing and being able to do that in a space also where perhaps it felt less pressurized, less viewed, a little bit away from the Jewish community I grew up in. Um, and I think the other thing for me is kind of saying like, if somebody says I can't do something, then I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it doubly, like that I'm not gonna be told I can't do something. And something in me felt like I was told that I couldn't do burlesque. So um yeah I'm absolutely going to do that and I'm not just going to go to the dance class but I'm going to sign up for the troop course and then the solo course and then yeah I'm going to strip on stage and do you know what like that has been the most liberating thing of my life and people are like oh my god how do you do that and I'm like how do you not have like a hundred people cheer for you naked on a stage it's the best feeling in the world and in that moment it's so not about what body you're presenting it's about being celebrated by a community of people who recognize your creativity you as a person you showing up you giving of yourself and it's amazing to me how much burlesque is not about the body that you show up to burlesque in and yet makes you love the body that you show up to burlesque in even more um I feel like that was a bit rambly, but I feel like that's maybe like a snippet or an insight into some of the the body liberation and fat liberation and fat positivity journey I've been on and I'd say one last thing is that um, I made a conscious effort a few years ago in my life to call myself fat 
and to do so without shame because when I was growing up that was the most shameful word I could think of I couldn't bring myself to say it sometimes and to just make the decision that I'm fat and that's not a negative word and like I'm never ever going to let anybody make me think that it is again and I think making that conscious decision has also been and and reclaiming that word for myself has been incredibly important. Lucy, that was not rambly. Um, that was that was your full journey of kind of how, how you got to where you are now and hearing about how there was a there was a kind of a piece about working against what, what, what you kind of were given by society in terms of the, the feelings that you had around your body and working to find spaces and acts that would liberate you in some way. And that was really beautiful. I, I relate to that a lot. Um, Minna, um, what does body liberation look like for you? I mean, we've heard the piece about how Jewish text and Judaism has been a source of wisdom and support for you, but are there other, other ways um, through activism or through maybe personal approaches? Yeah, so I'll say a word about personal approach and then I wanna push back on that concept a little bit. Um, so I think one, the phrase that recurs for me when I think about what it feels like to feel free in my body, which also certainly, as Lucy said, you know, comes from a lot of work. And I would also add, comes as part of an ongoing practice, because of course, for those of us, particularly in larger bodies, the rest of society is still saying things about us and to us. Um, so, um, so, the, but the phrase that feels the most central to me is the ability to live from the inside out, by which I mean to really be free of that sort of um, self-objectification that so much of us engage in of um, trying to judge ourselves by either what we look like or by what we imagine that we look like. Um, and um, that, uh, and yeah, that ability to, to live from the inside out rather than from the outside in feels really um, like a core piece of my own liberation. Um, and uh, the pushback would just be that um, I think that loving ourselves and um, and feeling liberated are absolutely wonderful things and can be um, can be important forms of activism as well. And I want to say that um, that fat liberation and body justice is something that's that people can participate in even if they don't like their bodies at all, right? That the idea that every human being is equally worthy and equally created in the divine image um, and equal and ought to have equal rights um, is not something that we have to love ourselves in order to believe or to work for. And I think that um, the reason that it feels important to me to say that is because I think especially in sort of the body positivity framing um, that part of what can sometimes be problematic about body positivity is um, the sense that sort of the ultimate goal is to love ourselves um, and to also feel like, you know, well, we're doing it wrong if we're not loving ourselves. Um, and that in fact, as with any other um, movement for social justice, we, we can actually um, be effective activists and um, people who are trying to make change around this issue, um, even if we don't particularly feel good about ourselves in any given moment. And so that, that actually is, I think, can also be a form of freedom, um, that, that we don't need to sort of add the extra pressure onto ourselves um, to, to love ourselves. Um, thank you for, thank you for bringing that into the conversation. I think it, it's, it's really important. And I think something I saw recently um, around pride and around, um, around queer kind of self-love um, is that self-love kind of frames, frames it as something that is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to love yourself, but it doesn't take into consideration that there are systems in place that are taking rights away from you. And I think it re relates to this piece as well, that it's not just about loving your body and always being in that kind of positive mode about it. It's about actually addressing the systems that are affecting, affecting that. Um, I really appreciate you bringing that into this. Um, Chelsea. Wow, both of them covered so much so thoughtfully. So thank you for that. Um, I agree with both sides wholeheartedly. And I would just add to this um, 
body talk, language, hearing it and feeling empowered now to shut it down or feeling um, confident and feeling like I have the tools to be able to push back when, you know, a neighbor complains to me about gaining 20 pounds during the pandemic or this whole year and a half. Um, I felt that body talk was nonstop, nonstop this concern for weight, the fear of weight on our bodies when I'm like, I'm just grateful to be alive. <laughs> I survived this. My body is amazing. Wow. Um, how about we look at that side of things? And so now, and after kind of it being slammed in your face every day, being able to shut it down and say, actually, let's redirect this conversation. Actually, I needed to gain 10 pounds to be able to get through the hardest year of my life. Um, so I would say language is huge. And I just want to agree with what both Lucy and Mena said. This is a journey. <laughs> this is a journey. And some days I get there and some days I am my full authentic self and I'm able to have those conversations and shut it down. And other times I get an Instagram DM that's horrible and it actually affects me. That's not all the time, but we're human beings. And I think just having the tools and always trying to take a step forward. And the last thing I'll say, which I've said a lot is visibility. We're in such an incredible time now that we are seeing um, figures that are in larger bodies, that are successful, that are loving themselves, that are putting it all out there. And I always say, man, 12 year old me <laughs> wishes that I had that representation, that permission to just be, to just be in my healthy body. Thank you. And that piece about language is, yeah, really, really vital in this conversation. I think it's time to, to bring in some questions from the community that we've kind of created here this evening. Um, and the, the first one that I received, actually, I'm going to mention a comment I just saw in the chat, which I think is really wonderful and, and relates to Minna's piece about Hanukkah, that, that Hanukkah also defies Greek norms from Ben Winton, um, uh, including the great kind of Greek male body archetype, which is really interesting and adds to the, adds to the conversation. Um, so one question I have here um, from one of our audiences, um, and this is their, their words, um, as someone who has experienced horrendous body image issues since they could speak, along with the amount of exposure to narratives of how we should look, um, how do you keep up with the self-love and not give in to those societal expectations? So we've spoken about kind of the fact that, that, that big um, factors affect this, and it's not just about self-love, but those societal expectations to, to be thin um, or to be a particular kind of body, what, what do you do about those on a, a daily basis? And I'll throw in there just from my point of view, I think social media has increased that exposure by a million. So let's throw all those things out. Um, who would like to address that first? Minna. Uh, so now I'm gonna contradict myself and say that um, absolutely uh, working from the outside in, can be a really important piece of this. So, um, and certainly with all of the um, anti-fatness and um, things that contribute to, um, to not accepting our bodies as they are on social media, um, thank goodness we also live in a world where you can actually curate what you see on social media. Um, and so my one sort of practical recommendation would be to surround yourself with images of people in all sorts of bodies loving their bodies. Um, as someone who's been involved in this um, work from back in the days when, you know, I had to order a magazine that came through the post um, in order to see any images, any sort of positive images. Um, that, to me, it feels like a miracle and a blessing to be able to open my Instagram feed and see people of my size, people larger than me, people smaller than me, people with all kinds of disabilities and different bodies, um, people in trans bodies, people in queer bodies, people in bodies of color, um, loving themselves um, and doing this work of loving ourselves and each other um, is incredibly um, powerful input um, for me to be able to soak in. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my one practical recommendation is find, find other images um, and, um, and enjoy them and allow them to, um, to support you and other people too. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, just wonderful um, body positive and um, body liberatory communities online right now. Um, thank you so much, Mona, for that practical piece. Um, Chelsea, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think <laughs> I'm so grateful for the images that come up on all of my social medias every day, but that's a choice. So um, echoing what Mena said, making the choice to support fat brands, fat artists, um, <laughs> all fat leaders, putting that in your world, surrounding that in your life, normalizing big bodies, normalizing the visibility of big bodies. Um, and for me, I have... I've developed a gratitude practice. My gratitude practice really kind of leans into this journey of self-love and fat liberation. And also for whatever reason, I feel that I'm the person, like I said earlier, to take off my beach cover up and be a big body on the beach to give permission to others, kind of cracking the ice sometimes. Um, and I want to continue forward with that by raising these sort of conversations and also asking questions. I sit in a lot of um, women's spaces in um, <laughs> different groups and asking, how are you all feeling about this? How is your self-love practice? What does that look like for you? Some people have never been asked that before. Some people have never been asked, what do you love about yourself? I think that we're kind of conditioned to think that we're not supposed to be radically in love with ourselves. And to me, it's the most important relationship um, wherever you are on that, but to take a step forward in it and to be able to hold space. Uh, usually for me, it's in female identified circles <laughs> um, to be able to talk about, you know, earlier I mentioned the pandemic and some of the fear points that I had, okay, I'm on lockdown and I just bought out a loaf of bread for the first time in five years. And what does that mean to me? And what does it mean to have to sit and face yourself? So going back to, I think, a gratitude practice and a daily self-love practice um, and be around fat people. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. Um, I'm going to move forward, and, and Lucy, if you have thoughts about this, kind of bring it into the, the answers about the next questions. But there's so many incredible questions, and you know, Chelsea, you just mentioned um, you know, female identifying people, kind of, and I, I want to talk about gender. Um, someone has asked, um, and the panel is all female identifying people. Um, can our panelists speak about the intersection of gender and size in terms of sexualization of bodies, sex and size? And in terms of kind of how people speak about the ease for females' bodies to lose weight, especially post-pregnancy. Lucy, do you want to kick off with that one? Um, yeah, that feels like a huge, another huge question. But um, I think what I will say, and I don't think this covers all of the questions, so I apologise in advance. Um, but I think something that's really interesting and, um, you know, I think recently there's been a lot of conversation around like what does it mean to be a woman and feel um, under threat the whole time and threat of violence um, and not ever feeling safe and I got into some really interesting conversations with people around the fact that as a fat woman my experience of that is very different um, I have experienced as a fat woman not necessarily being um, a threat of violence from being hypersexualized, but actually a threat of violence because my being as a fat woman threatens people's sense of themselves especially men I find or um I think you know I'm more I'm less scared of being catcalled and more scared of being um shouted at and fat shamed in public um I'm more scared that like my presence as a fat woman who isn't going to cover up is going to get me hurt than my presence as a woman being hypersexualized and so I suppose something to just add to the conversation and like what I'm thinking about when that question gets asked is just understanding that there are some experiences as like women, I don't like as, as women that we share and there's some that as fat women are quite unique. And I think our experience of like what it means to be a woman in an, is very different as a fat woman. Um, the things I'm scared of, um, the things that I experience are different. Um, and I think just to really say again that like my existence as a fat woman who, even if it wasn't visible that I loved myself, just my existence as a fat woman is threatening to some people. And like that 
that is key. Like, and I don't, I don't think we name that enough. Like that's threatening to some people. And like, that's something that I carry my existence as a woman and as a fat woman. Um, and that is such a large part of my experience as a woman. Thank you, Lucy. And Minna, what are your thoughts on this? So uh, just briefly, I want to talk about um, intersectionality in kind of the um, putting on my sociologist hat that um, in kind of the classical sense of um, two factors that interact with one another when we try to um, look at what causes what. Um, so um, one way that um, fatness and gender interact with one another um, is in uh, pay discrepancies. So um, at least on research that we have from the US, we know that there is a longstanding wage gap between men and women for doing the same work. Um, we also know now that there is a wage gap between fat people and their straight size counterparts. However, the wage gap between um, fat women and thin women is larger than the wage gap between fat men and thin men. And the wage gap between fat women and fat men um, is also larger than the wage gap between thin women and thin men. So just, I know that was a lot of like, suddenly I'm like talking statistics, but um, just to, to say that we actually have like concrete examples of how these two identities um, in, and marginalized identities interact in like real world um, places that, that mean that fat women are really at the bottom of that um, set of wage gap discrepancies and thin men are, are at the top. Thank you for that. I think, yeah, seeing, seeing those, those put against each other um, and seeing how fatness impacts the gender pay gap is really, really interesting. Um, Chelsea, do you have thoughts on this before um, we move on? Yeah, I think that, um, I don't think fat men are in the conversation yet, <laughs> at least from what I've seen. Um, a lot of the images that I've seen in social media and the conversations around fat liberation spaces are geared towards women. So would love to see more of that. I don't know that um, that space has been properly held yet. Um, kind of inkling sometimes of certain brands, you'll see a larger man, but um, I really wonder what that could look like in another few years um, <laughs> to be able to feel held the same way. Um, so that's a piece and I lost what I was gonna say after that. So I'll just push it forward. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Chelsea. And I'll just, I'll take off my, my chair hat for a second and like throw myself into the panel for just two, two seconds and then we'll move back to the, the people who really are, are here to speak about um, this issue. But my experience as, um, as a gay man um, and someone who was bullied from a young age for being fat, um, the intersection between those two things um, and the feeling of being fat, not being able to play sport, um, and the kind of in, the, the 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 way that that affects people affects how people perceive your masculinity um, is a really big part of of um, how gender impacts kind of I guess male experience of fatness. I have seen slowly and, and kind of as Minna and Chelsea suggested to kind of increase um, diversity in your social media feed. I've seen more and more um, fat men, specifically kind of fat gay men embracing their bodies. Um, one thing that we don't necessarily see so much is that in the gay male world, there's huge amounts of pressure to be a particular type of body that isn't as, um, as uh, kind of common in the straight male world. Um, and that's something that I've experienced quite a bit. Um, but wanted to just name that and kind of speak about kind of the way gender affects it in, in a different way. Um, um, but moving forward, um, one really beautiful question that I want to share before I'm going to ask you about um, kind of what the Jewish community can do, but one really beautiful question that's come up is um, what would it mean for you to think of the foremothers or other prominent Jewish figures from our text as fat? Um, many of the images in picture books and schooling are, you know, uh, smaller sized women um, or men 
Um, have you ever found representations of them as fat or even thought about this? I've seen a lot of this recently around um, creating images of people of different colors and different ethnicities, but has this been something that you've seen or thought about? Um, let's throw it to Minna first. So what uh, arose in my mind was not so much the four mothers, but um, the, I'm gonna forget which part of um, the prophets she's in, but um, there is a, a woman in the Hebrew Bible um, who's described as an Isha Gdola, a large woman, which is usually translated as meaning that she's a wealthy woman, um, which to me clearly means that, you know, we have this association between um, abundance in body and abundance in sort of stature in the, um, in the community in those times. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm one of the um, sort of my kind of for, for, for future, for further research, um, things that I'm thinking about lately is that Isha Gdullah, the large woman um, of, of the prophets. Um, yeah, that's really beautiful, Isha Gdullah. I wonder if we can, yeah, find that, find that source for afters if anyone's interested in it. I will, um, I'll go <laughs> um, Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to throw out the kind of a broader question um, to everybody, which is, um, what can the Jewish community be doing about this? Um, one person has asked, how can we confront weight stigma and body image in the Jewish community? Why, um, and it, why and, and can, is it harder for us as a community to discuss weight stigma? Um, and I'll throw that to Chelsea first. Well, I think first and foremost, radical welcoming. <laughs> radically welcoming your community regardless of size but the responsibility of that is also as a host to coming back to the chair situation making sure that you're looking through the lens of all of your community members looking through the lens of will they be comfortable in in my space in this holy space so i think the radical welcoming piece first and talking about this, <laughs> talking about this, talking about what does body talk look like, shutting it down when it's happening, right? Um, I just loved um, Mena's example of the positive association with <laughs> Hanukkah and this celebration of life and fat and, and all the things and turning it towards joy and celebration as opposed to policing um, and taking a deeper look at how we can prepare our youth to feel authentically comfortable in their Jewish spaces. And sometimes that's going to be looking at things in a reimagined way and being comfortable with that breaking tradition um, so that we can have a generation of confident, self-loving young people. That's really beautiful. I I'm interested to hear about what Lucy thinks about this from a kind of youth movement space um you know you are a role model by virtue of who you are but also by virtue of your your role in an organization like like noam what does it look like for you to create spaces in a jewish community that do better um i think when i hear this question i find it really hard to answer um what does that mean it feels like where to even begin um i think so much of the that phobia that I experience in the Jewish community actually comes out through microaggressions and like how do you combat that that's really hard and what does it mean to be the fat person in the room feeling like you're being difficult um, and policing people and demanding too much um, so I think there is responsibility on each and every one of us to shut down those microaggressions when we hear them let's stop moralizing food we're surrounded by food we're a jewish community let's stop moralizing that please um let's stop making jokes and easy quips at like weight and food and what people are doing and how people look let's stop um saying to people oh wow you look so healthy when what you mean is you look like you've lost weight like let's stop commenting on how people look let's stop commenting on anything that somebody couldn't have done something about that morning watch your language, watch how you're addressing people. Um, you know, it's those things. It's like, really, how do we watch our language? And also, how do we triumph fat people in spaces where they want to be triumphed? Like, let's not push people to the front of a room if they don't want to be there. But, you know, how do we make, how do we make space for those people? How do we make space for fat role models? Um, especially as 
often fat people are told to be less in every way. And so you get scared to use your voice, you get scared to talk up because that's part of being too much, too big, too, too everything. Um, so how do you give space to fat people who've been told they're too much? Um, and I think there's something about if you are a fat person, how do you really own that? Like for me, part of why I love being in a position where I can be a role model is talking really proudly about my body and giving other people permission to do that um, and being very proudly fat in that space. And I think just that and holding that space, if you're able to, um, is incredibly important. You said it was a really big question, but then you answered it on point at every single second. Um, thank you. Yeah, that, that piece about moralizing food and kind of saying, this is a good food, this is a bad food, that really comes up so often and is so just normalized in our community. Um, Mina, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. And also we, we chatted about this a little bit in our, in our pre-conversation about the effect of collective traumas like the Holocaust on how people perceive um, weight within our community. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so I think there are absolutely ways that, um, that other aspects of Jewish culture um, certainly around um, Holocaust trauma and post-trauma um, impacts um, how fat phobia plays out. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about intersectionality, it's also worth thinking about um, the intersection of fat phobia and anti-Semitism and, um, and, um, and how those have um, had interplay over the years and sort of the depiction of, of Jews in media um, and in other ways. Um, I think, you know, it, it is a big question and won't, won't surprise you to hear that the thing that I think people ought to do in order to work on this is to support Fat Torah and um, come and be part of our um, online community and um, on our mailing list and um, all of those good things because our real priority right now is um, working with Jewish communities around um, how to make them uh, spaces of belonging for everybody. Um, and so we look at, um, in my trainings and teaching, um, we look at four different areas of, um, of impact and potential action, meaning four different uh, areas where um, anti-fatness can be particularly harmful in, in the Jewish communal context, and also where there are opportunities for um, for turning that around. And those four areas are sacred space, sacred speech, sacred time, and sacred text, right? So sacred space is exactly what Chelsea's talking about with literally making sure that there are seats that accommodate people um, and other ways of thinking about how to make our spaces welcoming. Um, sacred speech is really um, very much, you know, what Lucy um, was touching on, that we have this sense in Jewish tradition of the creative and destructive power of, of speech, right? That we, we think of um, speech as the way that worlds are created and that worlds can be destroyed. Um, and so really working on, uh, on the element of speech. Uh, sacred time is absolutely about relating to our traditions and our traditional food ways, especially um, around, um, you know, how those can absolutely be um, sites of awful fat phobia and also um, sites of liberation. And then sacred text is, you know, actually looking at um, the traditions that are available to us in our um, in our texts, in our Torah, and in our prayers, um, and how those can be deployed in ways that are um, liberatory for all bodies. So, um, I'm, yeah, I think, um, you know, the good news and the bad news is that there's no shortage of work to be done. Right, the way that that's good news is that um, this is something that we can practice within ourselves and in those um, micro moments and in, uh, in larger scale ways as well. Thank you. Seeing an organization like Fat Toro with, with this multifaceted approach is incredible. I think it's, it's really, you know, building the structures that our community needs. I'm glad that you're here in the UK with us. I'm gonna stay with you for a second and ask you a question about, um, about health because this is, a, this is something that comes back um, to me a lot when I, when I was talking about this event with a lot of people um, in the community, I mean, we're doing this event at my big fat Jewish body and they'll say, well, what about health? You know, you know isn't, it, isn't it healthier to be skinnier? Isn't it healthier, you know, people who are, are fat or have, have more health issues? And, 
And one, I want to ask about kind of how to unpack that, how to debunk that. Um, and also, I think there, there'll be people on, on the call tonight that want recommendations for books to read, you know, because I think as much as we can listen to the, the incredible um, experiences tonight, I think some people are going to be those, those data, data people that want to read and understand. So if you could talk a little bit about that, Rabbi Minna, um, and maybe we'll kind of hear from Chelsea and Lucy about that as well. But where does the role of health come into this? Yeah, so to start with resources first, as soon as I'm done talking, I'll find and put in the chat actually um, three UK resources that I um, love, three folks, um, one fat activist and two fat activists slash physicians um, in the UK who are doing really wonderful work around this. Um, so uh, in terms of health itself, it's important to recognize that from a historical perspective, we know that weight stigma precedes concerns about fat people's health. And so when um, doctors start to be concerned about fat as unhealthy in like the 19 teens, 1920s, um, in, uh, that, that they're already coming to it from a, from a culture in which fat people are already deeply stigmatized. Um, so um, just historically, this idea that um, you know, that the real concern is fat people's health doesn't sort of doesn't hold up. Um, the resources that I'll put in the chat um, are all folks who are really doing excellent work on kind of the, the data side of actually looking at the evidence around um, what impacts fat people's health and, and, and other people's health. Um, we know, um, and so I'm, I want to direct you there because um, you know, I, I certainly know a lot about this and I'm also, you know, not a medical professional, don't want to be um, giving medical advice, um, but I will give some rabbinic advice, which is that um, even if you refuse to believe the data about what impacts fat people's health, I think it's important to think about, you know, if you truly believe um, that fat, that being fat is unhealthy and there's sort of nothing that can, can convince you that one could actually be um, fat and healthy, um, then it's important to think about, okay, well, what do our Jewish traditions tell us about how to be with people who are unhealthy and how to be with the sick? Because we actually have some wonderful thousands of year old traditions about what it means to be with sick people. Um, and one of my favorite um, pieces to bring up um, is the story in, um, in Talmud, in Brachot, about sort of the series of, of sick visits of, um, um, of Bikur Cholim, of visiting the sick, that um, that Rabbi Yochanan, who's a famed healer, um, goes on. He goes on these different visits. The very, very first question that he has for each of the person, that each of the people that he visits and subsequently heals, is: Is your suffering welcome to you? Um, and this has been interpreted in many ways. This question of: Is your suffering welcome to you? Um, but the way that I want to interpret it for us tonight is that even the inquiry into, may I enter into the space of your health, is something that we need to ask permission around and something that we need to get consent for. Um, and the idea that my health or that any fat person's health is somehow something that community members or leaders or people who see me on the street have some kind of right to enter into um, really goes against what we know about um, Jewish values around true caring for another human being, um, because true caring for another human being forefronts their humanity um, and the respect that they're due as a human um, and not whatever guesses we might have about, um, about what their health is or isn't. One of my favorite sort of quips about this, which I'll end with, um, is that the only thing that you can tell um, by looking at a fat person's body is the only thing that you can measure by looking at a fat person's body is your own level of weight stigma. Wow, I think yeah, I think that piece from from the Talmud about you know, that consent before you delve into someone's health and ask about you know probing into what you're what you're bringing into that conversation and whether it is um, clearly that that weight stigma. Um, Chelsea and then Lucy, what what are your thoughts about this and let us know what your experience has been around people talking about health when it comes to fat. Yeah, um, mine's a little bit more condensed and a little in the sense of it's none of your damn business. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's none of your business. 
none of your business. I wouldn't ask a thin person that I wouldn't ask anyone else that and leading with what Rabbi Mena said about these Jewish values, kavod, respect me, respect me um, and consent. And if it really is, if it's, you know, intention wise, um, you're really, really concerned about my health you're going to have to be real thoughtful of how you consent to talk to me about that. Cause it's none of your business. It really isn't. And I think that's for me kind of like shut it down. Um, the amount of work that goes into having to unpack a society um, that you've been conditioned to hate you, to hate your body, to not be seen as sexy, as beautiful as the norm. Um, there needs to be some permission points. And I think rooting into, um, rooting into that space and to feel confident to shut the conversation down. There's so many layers of work there, but really it's none of your business. <laughs> it's none of your business. Thank you, uh, Chelsea. I really, really appreciate that. That sentiment, and it's exactly what people should be saying about this, especially when we're talking about this covered, like that's what matters, you know, the respect and honor for people of all sizes. Lucy, what are your thoughts on this and anything that you're thinking about when it comes to when people throw the, oh, you know, what about health? Um, I thought I had few feelings and then listening to this, it turns out I have a lot of feelings. Um, I think a lot of them have been covered, so thank you for that. Um, I want to go back again to that, like, and I think Chelsea, like, you, you touched on this also, like, that moralizing point, like, first of all, it's none of your business, and second of all, who, who are you to say that good health or bad health makes me a good or bad person? Okay, maybe I am unhealthy. And what? Like, where's the follow on from that? You are like, we are once again in a society that is moralizing food and fat bodies. So I think to unpack that one level further, like we've moralized health um, and let's, let's undo that because that's helping no one. Um, like question that. Um, and also I want to, um, so a book to read, I've, I'm like almost finished it and I feel like it's changed my life and anyone who will listen to me, I'm telling them to read this book, um, Happy Fat by Sophie Hagen. I'm like reading it and like sobbing every 10 pages because I feel like it's the most validating thing I've ever read and I just feel like everyone needs to read it. But, you know, I want to amplify what she says in that and she touches on like, we're so concerned about the physical health of people that why are we not talking about the mental health of people? Why is it that for the sake of my physical health that you apparently care about, which is like I said, none of your business and actually has, and what, um, you are making, you are creating a world where people are made to hate themselves, where we're, you know, especially in my role working with young people, we are seeing more and more young people come through youth movements, go through schools with more and more mental health and well-being issues. And so we're adding an additional level of reasons to hate yourself and hate your body and question your place in, in the world. Um, why, why would we do that? Why would we not move to create a society with better mental health as well? As, you know, why aren't we looking at that? Um, so every time somebody asks about, what about health? I just think, what about mental health? What about creating a society that accepts people for exactly who they are, exactly how they show up and say to people, we love you for you because you are good enough exactly as you are and that you're worth and your worth in this world is not based on how you look. And I think that does much more for the health of many more people than you telling me what I should and shouldn't eat um, or what I should and shouldn't look like. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think, I think that the fact that we can discuss this and you can each kind of share a piece about that, I think will really help people who come at me and kind of come at, at you, you know, with these, Oh, health and this and then you know I think hearing that from each of you about kavod about consent about mental health is really important for our for our community here to hear so thank you um I'm gonna ask one final question um I've learned so much tonight and feel very privileged to be part of this conversation um and kind of built this community in the UK um for one night uh, and I hope that this spearheads and pushes kind of people to talk more about um, body liberation in the fat phobia in our communities but one thing I think about when I think about fatness um, and my personal experience with it is that younger self that that younger person um, so I want to ask each of you is to give a message to 
maybe the young people here, but the younger person, you know, your, your, your younger self, what would you tell them now that you're on this panel talking about fat liberation, you've been working in fat liberation and, and, and body liberation for a while now, what would you say to that person? So I'm gonna start with um, Chelsea. Think about this a lot. Um, and this is a kind of the baseline of why I do this is um, for 12 year old me. So <laughs> um, you're so enough. You're so enough how you are exactly right here, right this moment, whatever you're doing, you're so enough at any size. Um, fat liberation, body positivity, all of that for me was a road to learning to truly love myself. Um, not even, you know, I always called a meat jacket, <laughs> my body, yes, but to love me, who I am inside and, um, and to know that I'm very special and I can say that and I can love that and I can shine bright and um, I have a space and I can take up as much space as needed and I have style and I can show that off. Um, so to 12 year old Chelsea, you are enough and to love and live that. Thank you. Um, getting emotional. Um, Lucy. Um, can I get Chelsea to say that to 12 year old me? Cause that was perfect. Um, that, that is a lot of what I feel like you are good enough. And I think something that I'm actually learning um, I'll be honest in therapy at the moment is about the difference between self-esteem and self-worth um, and understanding that like my self-worth is not based on my um, ability to create, do um, and, and be in reaction to being fat, to make up for being fat, that like just being is good enough. Um, I think Chelsea, you said that perfectly. Um, and I think to echo another point, I would say to myself, like, hold yourself, love yourself, because this body is unbelievable and it will take you to places and allow you to do things and meet with people and see things that you never thought you would see and never thought you would get to do. Um, and what an incredible vessel and, and you know, to, to, to do that. And not only to go places and do things, but what a beautiful, wonderful, kind body for hugs and love and people um, and how how much you should love yourself for being able to put that into the world also with this body. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and Rina. I really want to tell 16-year-old uh, me that you will not regret for one single moment the decision to stop dieting. Um, through wishing you had friends and then having friends through um, being single and wishing you had a partner, through finding a partner, through wondering how all of this impacts how people perceive you in academic settings and in job settings, through wishing you had children and then having children, that not one single moment will you regret the decision to stop dieting. Breathe that in. Um, thank you to each of you. This has spoken to my 12 year old self. Um, and I'm sure many people in this space. Um, it's so important to me, you know, JW3's mission is to increase the volume variety um, um, the, of conversation in London and beyond. And I think the volume on this issue um, has been raised tonight and I hope people can hear, and I hope people can feel part of this space um, to take the education that we've had this evening and move it forward and bring it into our own communities wherever they may be. Um, thank you, Minna, thank you, Chelsea, thank you, Lucy, and thank you to our audience and our community here this evening. Um, please join us for future JW3 events. Um, next week, we are having a really special storytelling event with grandparents and young people um, of Sephardi and Mizrahi heritage, which we'll hear um, on next Tuesday, the 15th of June. I've put it in the chat now. Uh, make sure to follow Minna, um, on, on Fat Torah and join the mailing list and Chelsea and Lucy also have their own social media accounts where you can kind of see um, what they're doing with their, with their work. Um, but if you'd like to continue the conversation around fatness, body liberation, please be in contact with me. Um, we're looking at what we can do to create more of these conversations in our community um, and beyond. 
Um, thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you.